Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Reserve Bank. Welcome to our monetary policy statement for September. The Reserve Bank this morning has decided to leave the official cash rate on hold, unchanged, at 3 per cent. The global and domestic economies continue to recover, but the outlook has weakened somewhat since the June monetary policy mm -hmm. statement. And that's why we consider it appropriate today to keep the official cash rate on hold. The earthquake in Canterbury on the 4th of September significantly damaged a number of homes and businesses and some infrastructure, disrupting activity. This disruption inevitably is going to continue for some time yet. The eventual rebuild does mean that considerable resources are going to be required over the next two years, especially from the construction sector. If in the aftermath of this some prices of goods and services do rise temporarily, our monetary policy would look through that, staying focused on the medium term trend in inflation. We remind everybody that the policy targets agreement that we work monetary policy to explicitly says that we should look through temporary price increases generated by natural disasters. On the New Zealand-wide domestic economy, the household sector has remained quite cautious over this period, with consumer spending staying soft, house sales actually falling, and house prices approximately flat. There's been a continued weak demand for credit, and this all adds up to implying that household spending remains softer than we had previously forecast. On the global economy, the pace of expansion has been slowing slightly, with some forward indicators of American growth actually deteriorating a little. But the continued strength of the economies and strength of growth in Australia and in China will support demand for New Zealand exports. And that reinforces the continued contribution that we've had from these high export commodity prices. The overall picture, well, despite the slightly weakened outlook, we still expect growth. And that growth will progressively absorb the current surplus capacity that exists in the New Zealand economy over the next couple of years. The indirect tax increases from government and potential earthquake impacts on prices do mean that headline inflation will spark higher this year. But previous, our previous GST experience and the stability of the CPI inflation levels at around 2 per cent for the last 18 months and the continued subdued domestic demand mean that the inflation spike is likely to have little impact on medium-term price expectations. Over time, it's likely that further removal of monetary policy support will be required. The, we note here that the pace and extent of further increases in the OCR are likely to be more moderate than we projected in June. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the official statement. We're here open for questions to assist. I've got Dr John McDermott, Head of Economics at the Reserve Bank, and David Drage, Head of Financial Markets Research. Thanks. Any questions for us? In terms of the Christchurch earthquake, um, sorry. In terms of the Christchurch earthquake, um, prices, um, with people going out and buying stuff, I mean, that's going to put pressure on inflation, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think with the Christchurch earthquake, we've got to recognise there's a huge amount of uncertainty about the effects themselves and about what the statistics will show and when they'll show it, and there'll be a lot of noise around this and it'll be hard to interpret. But yes, yes, what's happened is, primarily what's happened has been a very large amount of damage to houses and other properties and some infrastructure. There's also been, of course, some damage to contents and to stocks and people will go out and replace those. Um, some of it's been happening already, but more will happen when there's insurance payouts, and we'll notice some of those things. Uh, the, the Christchurch effect uh, of all of this, we believe, is that during the current month, we're going to see a reduction in economic activity, 
but in subsequent quarters there will actually be an increase in economic activity. We think there's probably something like negative 0.3% on GDP at the minute. We think that by early next year there's actually somewhere in the vicinity of a half to 1% increase in GST, oh, sorry, of GDP from the effect of extra activity and extra purchases. Uh, but of course that extra activity is only going to rebuild past um, past assets has been clearly a big shock and a drop in values in the area. So Dr Bollard, it, it didn't actually have any influence on the decision that you made today, or very little influence on the decision today to hold? We made our decision, our interim decision, to hold um, actually the day before the earthquake. So that was a decision that was made quite independent of the earthquake. and. Uh, the earthquake hasn't changed our view on this. That was a decision that was made on the, our view of the strength of the New Zealand economy and the world economy. Um, Dr Bollard, what are we to make of um, a central bank forecasting negative real interest rates, or at least 90-day rates, over the year ahead? What, what's that telling us about the world we live in? Well, it's uh, uh, a world that's um, got much flatter growth projections. Uh, it's a world that's uh, already uh, having to deal with quite significant um, interest rates as a result of the increase in premium on risk coming out of the crisis. Um, it's an unusual world in some respects. I don't know if you'd want to, either of you want to add to that? Yeah, it, it's worth highlighting that those interest rates are only negative if you take the headline CPI number. If you take underlying inflation, in fact, they don't turn negative. Governor, why do you think that the prices of some goods and services may increase in the wake of the quake? Well, I mean, clearly there'll be shortages, there'll be bottlenecks, there'll be a heap of construction activity, there'll be a big demand for um, materials to go into rebuilding and the markets will take some time to respond to that. So there will be an increase in prices now. I mean, this is um, pre predictable, um, anticipated by the policy targets agreement, and even desirable in a limited extent, because it really does reflect shortages, and those increased prices are going to mean that it will be worthwhile for builders to move from Auckland and for materials to move from Dunedin to be attracted in for those. Uh, that's part of the normal economic process. What we will be... What we would be concerned about would be if prices in Auckland and Dunedin started picking up as a result of that. Uh, th that's what, th or th that's broadly the sort of um, focus that we would have. But we would actually expect to see some price, um, temporary price effects in Christchurch. How likely is it that prices in other regions may increase? Uh, you could understand why it might happen at the margin as some resources get diverted out of those regions to greater needs and greater prices in Christchurch, but we'd think that would only be pretty marginal. Uh, you'll note in our forecast that we do provide a ready retina box giving some idea of magnitudes of what price increases could do to the CPI, and uh, the broad implication of that is that provided construction cost inflation is broadly limited to impacts around Canterbury, it doesn't have a major impact nationally. Uh, if it were to go beyond that, then that's the sort of thing that we would focus much more on. And you say as well that it's important to stress that New Zealand is worse off, not better off, after the earthquake? Yeah, well, absolutely. Otherwise, we'd go around promoting natural disasters to improve New Zealand. Uh, there'll be more activity, but balance sheets are weaker and people are worse off. And what we're looking to is a broad picture where over the next two years uh, those balance sheets get back into position, property gets repaired, assets get replaced, and then you have to of course ask who will pay for all of that. And on the residential side most of that will happen through Earthquake Commission and through private insurance. Uh, there's likely a little bit of underinsurance. we don't think it's major in the residential area, uh, it could be a little bit more in the, in the business sector. Uh, in addition, in that box, we track through who will actually pay for that insurance. And of course, some of that comes out of New Zealand premium and New Zealand assets, but a fair amount of it also comes from reinsurance offshore. For the really nerdy amongst you, there's some very interesting questions about what happens to the capital account of the balance of payments, but I won't bore you all with that right now. 
house prices, um, you point out the conditions in the housing market, that there's a possibility of, um, well, you expect expect modest declines, but it's a possibility of a more noticeable decrease. Well, what sort of probability are you attaching to that and, and what sort of price declines are you talking about? Uh, we're talking about flat to minor price declines at the moment, um, but it's, we do note that this has continued soft for a while and house sales have actually fallen away quite a lot. We think that's a reaction of Householders who are very cautious at the minute and are simply not going through transactions that they might otherwise do. There's still fundamental drivers that would lead to more residential investment and house price increases, such as migration. But that hasn't had that effect recently, so we do note that we'll be watching quite closely over the next few months the data that comes through on the housing sector. We get a lot of data, a lot of it is quite up to date, so we do have good, good information in, uh, on that. Uh, we'd be looking um, to ensure that, we're, that, that eventually that this housing price cycle does bottom out and um, that you start to see stability in it. But what sort of, what sort of are we don't have a, a particular statistical number for you here, Nigel. Governor, Governor do you think the uh, chances of a double dip recession in the US have receded in recent weeks, or are you still concerned that might yet occur? Uh, our forecasts don't, and are nowhere near a double dip recession. Um, it's more that there's been a slowdown in the rate of recovery out of growth, but the American numbers still indicate significant growth, and um, that's broadly the consensus views around the financial markets. Dr Bollard, is it, is it fair to say that New Zealand is probably in a better position than many other countries given the strength of uh, Australia and China? Yes, it's a, more and more it looks like a two-tier growth world and um, countries that have got access to that Asian, East Asian and South Asian growth path uh, continue to do pretty well and we've got pretty strong commodity prices uh, that that's being reinforced by recent data, including another dairy price auction this morning. And uh, that, after all, is what drives the New Zealand economy. Now, we do note that uh, what farmers are doing with those good returns is retiring debt to a large extent, so we're not seeing that resulting in a lot of extra spending in the high street. But the overall numbers don't look too bad. Dr Bollard, you've got, uh, you commented a couple of times here that uh, the stimulatory impulse from, uh, from the OCR seems to be less effective than it was. Um, does that mean that what the neutral level could be is lower than you might have assumed previously and roughly ballpark, what might that figure be? Well, um, yeah, we've s certainly um, postulated in the past that that neutral rate so the rate at which the OCR isn't stimulatory but also isn't contractionary um, is probably lower than we've felt in the past. We still, we, we still believe that. There's a number of reasons why that might be the case. Uh, they all point in that direction. But we haven't tried to estimate that. Uh, there's a lot of prices and other data changing around the world at the minute. And I think a lot of other central banks are looking at their own countries and and questioning that as well. We still take the view that that rate is lower than it used to be. No, we don't have a particular no a number for you. Dr Muller, there was some speculation that in the lead up to the 1st of October we may see a spike in spending. Are you not expecting that to happen? The information we're getting out of the retail industry is that retailers made a decision that they probably didn't need to stock up in advance of GST, and that's generally been vindicated by the fact that householders haven't rushed out in a pre-GST spend up. And in addition, we're not actually expecting either a slowdown after GST or indeed an increase in response to the income tax increases that come through on the 1st of October. So generally it looks like it's been pretty smooth through that period. Uh, we're of course yet to see what actually happens on 1st October, on, but the information we're getting on prices are yes, there will be some headline prices go up, they're sort of in the ballpark that we're expecting. 
uh, we do pay a lot of attention to price expectation surveys and New Zealanders generally think prices will go up, sp spike, it'll be temporary, uh, inflation will come off again and that's what our forecasts agree with. Um, you've sounded some warnings about uh, costs like electricity rising by more than the rate of inflation. Are you still concerned about that? Uh, we still think it's that um, it's important that the non-traded sector, the utilities and those parts of it that m may be able to actually to commercially to pass on a price rise because there's less competition there, don't take advantage of that to do that. So we're very clear that electricity companies and others in that position are aware of our views. It's up to them to make their decisions. We'll keep watching those. Um, you seem to be putting a lot of store in um, business investment and household spending recovering uh, after sort of 2011, 2012 as export prices come down. Um, what happens if that spending uh, by businesses and households doesn't pick up to pick up that slack? Um, do you see that the, the bottom band of the inflation target being threatened at all? Uh, to the last part of your question, no, we don't see it being threatened. Um, what, what would be more of a concern would be that you'd find GDP was pretty static as well. And that would only really happen if we got considerably worse news from around the world. So we, don't, we expect to see gradual recovery. This is a story that's pretty consistent with a lot of other OECD countries at the minute. Cautious households, cautious business, investing, but generally financing that investment off retained earnings, not going out to banks to get new credit. Uh, we think that gradually will res return to more traditional growth. Uh, if it didn't, that would be a different outlook for us. But you, ma you make the comment that um that a lot of that export income will be used to pay off bank debt by f farmers taking that choice. Um, does that mean, though, there is a risk that that money won't flow through to the household and business sectors? It won't be there in the bank, if you like, to uh, to boost growth uh, in 2011-2012? Uh, I mean, what it means is that, ha that farmers get their balance sheets back into a more sensible balance and that does mean that they would then have enough confidence to start spending more and um, they're much better positioned for the future so one can absolutely see why they're doing that. Uh, it, it just means that it effectively it delays some consumption out a year or two. Ladies and gentlemen, any more questions? Bernard. Uh, can you talk about how deleveraging uh, may affect um, the economy in the next couple of years and the outlook for interest rates? Well, we are seeing deleveraging. We're seeing it in the, uh, in the household sector as people look to pay down ha household debt. And as we just discussed, we're seeing it in the business sector as well. Business sector balance sheets look in pretty good shape to us. They look a lot better than the last bad business recession, which was 1993-92, when there are a lot of failures, a lot of impairments, and a lot of stress. That isn't the case at the minute. The household sector is a bit different. Uh, as you know, we've taken on more debt and now New Zealanders for over the last year have felt that they are overexposed and they are looking to reduce debt. They're doing that quite significantly. It does make it harder for them to deleverage if house prices are going down at the same time. That's been a distinct lesson out of Britain and the United States where if your asset value goes down it is harder to actually reduce your relative exposure to debt on that asset. We don't think that's a particular problem in New Zealand at this stage. We'll keep looking at all those data. But yeah, um, people are definitely saying we feel more comfortable if we've got less debt on the balance sheet. Overall, over time, that's definitely, we feel, a desirable move. There's a question about how fast we would like to see that happen. Are you concerned at all about um, how much lending the banks are doing and whether there's a, a supply of credit issue or whether it's simply a demand issue? You mean how little lending they're doing? Uh, we um, note that, that's, uh, that there is credit available. It's more expensive than it used to be. There's tighter conditions on it, but the banks are certainly finding there isn't much demand for, for credit from the business sector and the household sector. On the household side, no, we're not particularly concerned. On the business side, we would want to see bank credit flowing again 
um, in order to ensure that New Zealand businesses are there investing for the future. Uh, we do need to see that happening. Uh, we believe that banks also believe that and would like to actually be getting some credit out the door at the minute. It's more a demand story. And just finally, uh, internationally, um, there's some talk about the Federal Reserve uh, having to um, bring in new quantitative easing measures. The Bank of Japan uh, yesterday intervened uh, to um, push the yen down. Uh, are you concerned that um, competitive devaluations may change the economic outlook and force New Zealand into something similar? Well, we've been through this very nasty crisis without the sort of competitive negative policy actions that marked the 1930s depression. We haven't seen a lot of competitive trade barriers being put in place. We've seen reasonable uh, cooperation around the important parts of the global economy. We certainly wouldn't want to see that change. We can see that this building pressures and concerns in some of these northern countries about exchange rate determination and about monetary policy. Uh, they will continue to work through those. Uh, we're hopeful we're not going to see it spill over into the international arena. But the Japanese move is an indication of how much concern they've got around exchange rates. And indeed, I don't think many people would say that the international determination of exchange rates is happening the way we would like in response to really fundamental economic drivers. Do you see the new banking rules um, as they stand at the moment? Uh, how do you see them affecting New Zealand? Well, the Basel Committee has now announced what looked like to be its final set of rules for what we're loosely calling Basel III. They're, they've yet to be agreed by leaders. That'll happen in Korea, G20 in November. Uh, yeah, we're, they've all been well signalled. We've gone through all these things. Uh, they're quite complicated. They run from capital through leverage, through liquidity. Uh, even more complicated is, a in some cases, a very slow timetable for introduction right through to 2018. Uh, to, the short answer to your question, no, New Zealand banks are well positioned with regard to quantity and quality of capital and in the short term it's not going to make much difference to them at all. Could it have an impact downstream um, as international banks do actually have to get more equity on board and could capital become more expensive than the counterfactual? Yes, it is possible, but that'll be an international thing rather than an Australia-New Zealand thing. Uh, hi, sorry, Dr. Bola. Just going over um, the the early material about the earthquake. I, I didn't quite understand how the earthquakes affected your decision today. Um, can you just quickly clarify that? We made our decision before the earthquake. There was nothing in the event of the earthquake that led us to want to. Uh, we did review the decision. There was nothing that led us to want to change our our OCR judgment, or indeed the um, communication around it. It is a, comp I mean, it's obviously a, a disaster and a very unpleasant one. Um, it's a complicated one to understand what the effects are going to be through the economy. We've tried to clarify our thinking at the minute on that, but we do have to emphasise there's a heap of assumptions in there. There's a lot of questions about the data and how that will come through, and some of that will change over the next little while. Based on what we've got currently, we saw no reason to change our decision to hold the OCO. So, Dr. Bollard, just in terms of um, looking at it, further interest rate uh, decisions, they're still going to go up? And if so, does the changes to that GDP growth, even though you're saying it has no, the Canterbury earthquake doesn't necessarily have a, an effect on the overall wealth, does that affect at all about where, how that interest rate increases will pan out in terms of that path? Uh, we don't think in a very significant way at the moment. It, it's um, not unhelpful that we're on hold at the minute and therefore we've got a bit of time to assess over the next quarter or so just how uh, the Canterbury earthquake reconstruction develops and what it looks like the economic pressures from that are. But um, as you know, we've got a 90-day interest track in there which is significantly, which shows increases in the OCR but at a slower rate to a, to a lower level than we had in June. So it's, a, it's still a story of increasing, needing to increase the OCR in out years, 
but it's a softer story than we had before. I understand the cost of uh, coffee is going to increase 12% um, in Wellington uh, around October 1. Uh, what's your message to those people who are planning price changes around then? Message on coffee is don't do it. Uh, the general message, however, is that they will have to follow market forces and make their own decisions around that. But uh, we continue to have a view that um, we would be watching closely any second round or indirect effects or people using the GST increase as a veil to push up prices for other reasons and that's the sort of thing that monetary policy would be more focused on and more likely to stand against. Uh, but um, as I said our general intelligence is that we're going to see reasonably subdued GST related increases and of course uh, most people are now aware that on balance they're better off um, as a result of the income tax reductions happening at the same time. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of the conference.